The Song of Peace, Begin's Vision and Egypt Today. We have a real treat for many of you that have been with us in this special relationship that we have, uh, that we're so delighted to be able to bring great collabor collaboratory uh, uh, films and documenta documentary films in collaboration with the Office of Cultural Affairs of the Consul General of Israel in New York. Today, we are looking um, very specifically at the lens of Egypt. And I know we have uh, a ter terrific uh, audience of people around the world who have already uh, logged in uh, to our webinar. So I would love, first of all, just for all of you that are here live on the webinar, if you personally, uh, like me, when I was a student at Tel Aviv University and were able to get on a bus and just uh, go visit Egypt for the first time and have a personal interaction, if any of you either got on uh, an LL -L plane or, or a bus and were a visitor from, from either from Israel or from the United States or elsewhere, after the Camp David Peace Treaty, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, put it in the chat. Let us know what year uh, you were there and any, uh, 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 you know, a word or two of an impression that you had. We will be exploring this today through two very distinct lenses. First, through the lens of a filmmaker, which we'll, uh, I'll introduce in a moment, that looks at the legacy of Menachem Begin. And we're going to take a very, very uh, uh, focused view of Begin's thinking and his motivations for uh, trying to pull off a piece that many people thought was impossible to have. Then we're going to look through the lens of two people, uh, two uh, uh, prominent Israelis who are really experts on Egypt and the Arab world in their own rights. Uh, we'll be talking today with Ambassador Chaim Koren, who he, he himself was the former ambassador to the Republic of Egypt during the period of 2014 to 2016. He's no stranger to the United States, having also served in a diplomatic capacity in Chicago, but also um, uh, working as an honorary member of the Center of Middle East Studies at the University of Chicago. Uh, he currently now teaches at the IDC in Herzliya, where we have many friends, and we stole him away from his students today to join us and share of hit with from his insights of working directly as an Israeli government <laughs> official. He's worked around the world in other uh, countries, and uh, we will hear that unique perspective from Ambassador Koren. Uh, we will also be joined on the panel with expert uh, insights today from Professor uh, Gabi uh, Rosenbaum, uh, who has the distinction of having three degrees from Tel Aviv University a BA, an MA, and a PhD from Tel Aviv University. And he will be looking through his particular lens of actually having established at the Israeli Academic Center in Cairo as early as 2006. He's not been uh, in residency there uh, most recently, but he has uh, um, uh, uh, been uh, present in Egypt uh, over the last several years on a continuous base, basis, has uh, contacts with academics, but also people on the street. And today we will be exploring, after we see these introductory uh, film segments, how the Arab people, how the Egyptian people really responded uh, to the uh, breakthrough of the peace treaty. So we're going to begin our segment today uh, with looking at three very, very, very um, uh, focused clips from a much longer a film called The Song of Peace uh, that was created by uh, Levi Zinni, who is with us today, and we'll introduce uh, the clip we're, we're seeing. Just so you have the broader perspective, this is part of a trilogy about Menachem Begin. And uh, spoiler alert here, or an early Hanukkah or Christmas present for everyone, at the end of the call, for those of you that get a taste of this amazing documentary film and are interested to see the full production, we will be sending a complimentary present with a link for the next week for everyone to be able to uh, watch it, enjoy it, and really reflect on it. Today, we are going to begin uh, with a master uh, Israeli documentary filmmaker. Um, he is the founder of, of Doc Films Productions in Tel Aviv and has a long documentary history of over 40 years of, of prizes uh, for both at the local level and international level, having previously won the Israel Ministry of Education 
a documentary a filmmaking award twice in 1999 and 2012. So today we're going to actually have uh, uh, the privilege after uh, uh, the introduction of Levy's introduction, setting the stage for these first couple of clips to actually get uh, a, a close up of Begin the individual, as well as the people uh, who were affected by this monumental historic decision. So Levy, let me start with you. Maybe you could just share a few uh, words about the film itself, uh, the, the broader film um, uh, that we're introducing today, and then we'll move into the clip segments. Uh, okay, I, the film is about <clears throat> the trilogy. It's a three, uh, three episodes, uh, television, three episodes uh, about Menachem Begin. And the first episode is about uh, the peace treaty that he signed with Egypt, which was uh, a great... Uh, a great success, you know, you, you, we should remember that uh, three years before, in 1974, in winter of se one, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, 1973, uh, at October, there was a, a, a kind of a trauma, a Israeli trauma, is because of the uh, what we call Yom Kippur War, uh, October War, as the Egyptians call it. And four years later, uh, Anwar Sadat, it's, it was a, almost exactly, I, they, he came in November to Israel, November 77, uh, came to Israel, to the Knesset, and there was, as, as they starting, Begin and Sadat started, the way to the peace treaty, which took quite a long time. Uh, usually we are, we know, or the story is that all begin that when Sadat suggested in, a, <clears throat> in the Egyptian parliament that he willing to come to the Knesset and speak to the Israeli about, uh, about his, uh, about his uh, peace dream, Actually, behind the scene, before this statement, Begin, since he uh, came to the PM office, started to look, started uh, trying to find ways to send messages to Sadat. He used uh, the uh, Romanian president Ceausescu, you see, still remember him? Uh, he used the uh, uh, Parshan Shah. True, if you should remember him, there was a meeting between Moshe Dayan, uh, the foreign, foreign, uh, <clears throat> foreign uh, minister of Israel, with the uh, Egyptian PM at, at Morocco, and begging sent messages. There is, we can talk. And let's say let's say it's a quite um, quite a surprise because Begin, we we when uh, in Israel when we uh, when the election when he won the election, everybody was uh, thought here we are we, here we are going to next to the next war, to the next war. Nobody thought that Begin is going to be the uh, a peacemaker, and it was a, quite a surprise. And uh, there was the two leaders that jumped, Sadat and Menachem Begin, jumped on the opportunity. And let's, I think there was, a, even it's not in my film because I was very concentrated in Begin, uh, I think the American media did a lot of work uh, about those two leaders and they brought them after they just say a few words and they jump on them and they put them on TV and they, uh, both of them and they had to, to promise to each, to each other that they are going all the way, all the way to the peace. Uh, afterwards, it took a long time because uh, it's not was just a peace between uh, Egypt and Israel. Uh, the Egyptian wanted to solve the Palestinian uh, uh, conflict. At the, 
uh, while uh, uh, going to the peace treaty, because they, they saw themselves as a representative of the Arab, uh, the Arab world. And according to, this was, to that was a lot of uh, negotiation and problems and so on. I think uh, in a way, I, it seems that they came to agreement about, about uh, withdrawal from Sinai, from all of Sinai, quite uh, it, at the beginning, even there was a, still a, a conflict about what we, you got to be with the uh, um, settlements that was uh, in the uh, north of Sinai. Uh, it was a, it was a quite a courage, a courage it, uh, from begging to to go to this peace treatment, and as an Israeli, I must say I'm very very glad. And you know, today the Egyptians are uh, the bridge, the bridge between uh, Israel and the Hamas, and which is great. I mean, it's part of changing the whole area. It was the first step to change the area and the relationship between Israel and the uh, Arabs uh, that around the Israel. And there is still the Palestinian uh, conflict, the pa Palestinian problem that uh, one day, I hope, we'll come to that solution. Okay, well, I think that's, that is uh, uh, certainly the glimmer in the eye of both Begin and Sadat. And, and now let's move to the clips themselves. Uh, we're going to look uh, uh, first at, at Sadat coming and arriving in Israel, and then afterwards, Begin uh, uh, shortly after arriving in, in, in Egypt. And we'll see those two in rapid succession. And I encourage everyone to uh, keep a close eye on the reactions of the populace in the respective countries around these two visits. Um, so we'll put on those two clips now and and then um, show you a third one that sort of culminates uh, this sort of opening uh, uh, segment where we'll um, uh, allow everyone to just get a taste of uh, the um, of, of the film itself, and um, uh, you use the word courage, Levy. Um, I, I, I believe it, it, it certainly there were great risks involved and opposition, obviously that we'll talk about. Um, but the uh, indeed uh, the 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 courage uh, to move forward uh, with this uh, vision of peace um, uh, uh, created some reality today that many of us take for granted, um, even if it's an imperfect peace. So we will um, uh, pull those up um, uh, momentarily and um, uh, and give everyone a little bit of a taste of uh, the the film that you're working on. I did mention that the film is actually part of a, a, a trilogy, and um, uh, uh, that for those of you that that are interested in you know part of our purpose in the, in this is exploring a very specific topic with two experts. Um, who really uh, uh, can, will be able to share in the second segment of this, uh, uh, you know, what's happening. So we'll go now with the segment. הרגע השמח ביותר בקריירה שלי היה כשעמדתי בנמל התעופה בן גוריון, את הדלת נפתחת ואמרתי את תשע המילים, ועכשיו הנשיא סאדאת על כבש המדרגות מנופף ידו לשלום. יורד גבר, לבוש, טיפ טופ, מחויית, מחויך, דמות... גבוהה, הערבי הקצת מסתורי, שחום, גבוה, באמת כמו איזה סצנה מאיזה סרט כמו אגדה.
היינו הדור שראה את מלחמת ששת הימים ואת מלחמת יום הכיפורים ו- ואת מלחמת ההתשה בתווך, ולחשוב שאנואר סאדאת מגיע לישראל. זה היה בלתי נתפס. סאדאת עבר לאורך רחובותיה הצוהלים של ירושלים במסלול המקובל. נאום בכנסת, יד ושם, מפגש עם הנשיא וכך הלאה. מועד המסע לירושלים נקבע במכוון ליום חג הקורבן המוסלמי, עיד אל-אדחא. תפילת סאדאת באל-אקצא בעיצומו של החג הגדול כוונה לעיניהם של המאמינים המוסלמים. ראו, ביקש לומר, אם נשלים עם הישראלים, נוכל להתפלל במקום הקדוש. המסר של סאדאת נדחה. העולם הערבי ראה בו בוגד. בבוקר שאחרי עמדתי במשרד ראש הממשלה ושידרתי, ובגין יוצא מפגישה עם סאדאת, ואז הוא ניגש אליי ואומר, מר קיטל, אתה יכול לבשר למאזינים שנשיא מצרים ואני הסכמנו שאנחנו לא עוד מלחמה, no more war. שזה היה דבר דרמטי, תחשוב, זה אחרי כמה שעות של פגישה, עוד לפני שהוסכמו העקרונות, כבר יש הסכמה על עיקרון שמה שלא יהיה, לא עוד מלחמה. וכך אנחנו יוצאים למצרים כדי לנהל משא ומתן על חוזה שלום כי שווים עם שווים רק כבוד הדדי ורצון הדדי הם שיביאו לשלום. פתאום אני רואה את, את סאדאת עושה ככה ובא משרת והוא אומר לו, אפתח לי שובק, אפתח את החלום. כעוס, כן, והוא תמיד קצת הזיע. אז אני קורא ככה לראש הממשלה ואומר לו, הוא מאוד מתוח. הוא מסתכל עליו ואומר, גם אני. אמרתי, הוא בא, <laughs> פה, 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 פה ישנה שמחה. בגין משוכנע שתוכנית האוטונומיה שלו היא הפתרון המושלם לסוגיה הפלסטינית. הוא פורס אותה על כל פרטיה באוזני סאדאת, שבלשון המעטה לא מתלהב. הפסגה שתלו בה תקוות גדולות נכשלה. And in the Gaza Strip, a Palestinian state should be established. The position of Israel is that the Palestinian Arabs residing in Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza District should enjoy self-rule. Is there any possibility this meeting could be a failure? Maybe. Maybe. Why not? במסע הארוך אל השלום בלטו הבדלי התרבות והמזג שבין שני המנהיגים. האחד, סאדאת, מתעב פרטים, ספונטני, נועז, והשני, בגין, משפטן, דקדקן, שלכל אות משמעות גורלית בעיניו. זו הייתה מערכת יחסים מיוחדת במינה. היו בה עליות ומורדות בצורה דרמטית מאוד, אבל היה עוד משהו שאיחד אותם. שניהם היו חולי לב. אוקיי, אז אנחנו עכשיו נעשה את הסטייג' לוי לפרוסס. ‫אני אומר, 
thinking of that something is going to be a break and cut as a, a, a American president arrived to Israel to gather both of them together again and uh, good for us. They signed it after all. Uh, again, what what you want me to, uh, what you're you asking? Well, you asked me a question? Well, let, let's go ahead and, and, and play the clip. You introduced it. I think uh, uh, we are going to look at that bridge uh, be between uh, the, the, the time uh, that they uh, uh, met at Camp David and then actually signed on the White House lawn. So uh, we'll, we'll bring that up now and take a look at a piece of history that, that uh, uh, many of us take for granted now, but, but uh, certainly uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the implications afterwards and the questions are already coming in. אחרי 13 ימים של דיונים אינטנסיביים, משברים קשים ולחץ איקאה של הנשיא קרטר, עשן לבן מתעמר מעל קמפ דיוויד. אדריכלי השלום מתקבלים בארצותיהם באהבה ובתרועות שמחה. המתנגדים, והם רבים, נדחקים בשלב הזה אל קצה התמונה. הכנסת מתבקשת לאשר את הסכם קמפ דיוויד. חברי הכנסת, אני אבקש שקט. ההצגה הייתה בקמפ דיוויד, ההצגה היא לא כאן. הדיון יצרי וסוער. אני לא אתן לראש הממשלה היום לומר לעם ישראל דברים שאין משלם. חברת הכנסת זבולה כהן, אני קורא אותה לסדר פעם חושית. בגין מציב את האפשרויות בחדות. הסכם שלום. או שימור ההתיישבות בפתחת רפיח. זאתי הברירה, אלה הן שתי אפשרויות, אין שלישית, ואני מכריז פה כי זו הדרך המוליכה לשלום, זה האינטרס הלאומי העליון, גם של ידידיי וחבריי המתיישבים. התוצאה, 13 חברי כנסת מתנגדים, 17 נמנעים, 84 מצביעים בעד. נדמה לי שאני מסוגל לצייר לי בדמיוני את עומק המכאוב בו התנסית כאשר חתמת על כתב הסכם הדורש סילוק יישובים עבריים. כותב בכתב יד עמוס עוז, אז במעמד של האדמו"ר החילוני של השמאל, אל היריב הפוליטי, ראש הממשלה מנחם בגין. אתה עמדת בקרב שהוא אולי הקשה שבכל הקרבות. מלחמת אדם בעל אמונות ודעות עם נפשו ועם הניגון שבשורש נשמתו. אפילו אם אכזיב אותך, חובתי לומר את האמת. אין לי שום מאבקים פנימיים כאלה. הייתי ונשארתי אדם ויהודי פשוט. אני משוכנע כי הדרך שבה הנני הולך, נכונה היא. כשרוצים להבין את בגין, את השקפת עולמו, השואה מילאה שם תפקיד מפתח. הוא היה עד ראייה, ניצל כתוצאה מכך שהוא ברח מוורשה. את אביו הובילו עם עוד קבוצה של יהודים לנהר בוג. והטביעו אותם שם, את אמו רצחו בבית החולים וגם את אחיו רצחו. כולם נרצחו. לא פעם שאלתי את נפשי, לו לא מותר היה לנסוע לבריסק. היי היית קם ושם פעמיך אל העיר בה בילית את שנות הנעורים השמשיות? לא. לא תבוא עוד בשערי העיר בה נולדת ולמדת וחלמת וסבלת וסמכת, כי איננה. אמנם ייתכן כי הבית הקטן בו אור האהבה ותוגת העוני שימשו בו בערבוביה, עודנו עומד על תילו. אך הבית, בית אמא ואבא, איננו, ולא יהיה. לא, לא אלך אחר הצללים. צללים חיים הם, לא ימותו. יותר משישה חודשים אחרי ועידת קמפ דיוויד, הגיע הרגע ההיסטורי. עושי השלום התכנסו לטקס החתימה על מדשאת הבית הלבן.
Ambassador Curran, um, you in, inherited the, in a sense, as a an, an ambassador, uh, a, a world in which it was a reality that Israel had uh, uh, diplomatic relations. Um, and it, it would be great to hear your perspective now on what, what came after. There was one question, though, that came early from one of our, our viewers, Milton, about what motivated Sadat um, to take the risk for peace, obviously he paid with his, his life. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you can help us make that transition. What was he expecting out of this, knowing the great risks he was taking? And then what ultimately was it was what? was the, that, that legacy in the Arab world once he uh, obviously uh, was out of the picture. The economic situation in Egypt was <clears throat> becoming worse and worse ever since the 60s. After the Kippur War, it was even worse. So in January 77, there were riots called the food riots, but that was actually endangering Sadat's uh, rule in Egypt. And I think one of the, more, the most important uh, motivation to come to the peace at that time was that he's not going to do something about <clears throat> the economy of Egypt together with the changes that he has done moving towards America, on one hand, leaving his uh, uh, connections with the USSR at that time, and also open the idea of some differences of wasting uh, too much uh, uh, measures in war, altogether it brought, brought him to the conclusion that it will better for, for him to have this breakthrough and <clears throat> winning in all these frontiers, bringing Egypt to a better situation. So now that, that he took those risks, he obviously had some national interests in mind to uh, advance, uh, but that was cut short and it was uh, ultimately turned over to um, uh, Mubarak and, and a, a new era began. So can you tell us a little bit about how Israel dealt with that transition and has how you, uh, in your official capacity, then tried to build on, 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 on the remains of, of, of that? Fortunately, I, have the, I had the opportunity to serve in Egypt twice. At the first time, in the end of the 80s, I was consul of Israel in Alexandria. And in, uh, from uh, 2014, I was ambassador in Cairo. So I could compare um, the situation uh, in two different times and see that Mubarak that was nominated to be the deputy of Sadat and in fact went on on his way, both in the idea of economy, the relationship with the US and the peace with Israel, uh, uh, would have to uh, challenge the situation in the end of the region and actually uh, adopting a situation that he is going with Israel in the peace treaty. Uh, uh, and uh, at, the, at that time, he would like to avoid the issue of uh, normalization, what called in Arabic, takbir, and keep it uh, for his own sake in order to use it later on while he was at the field in a with the other Arab world regarding to the issue that Egypt broke the pan arabist uh, pattern of going against it. So as Sadat said, not Egypt, Egypt, not Egypt would come back to the Arab world, but rather the Arab world would come back to Egypt, which happened in the war uh, between Iraq and Iran. Now, uh, later on, after Mubarak, this adopted uh, a different policy region again uh, uh, towards Israel and regionally and that is deserve a little bit more detail so uh, if you would like me to uh, concentrate on that I would like I would gladly do it 
Um, so, so, so why don't you give us just give us a, a, a brief summary of what that change uh, was and, and, and what motivated that? And then we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll conclude this segment with that. Uh, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi arrived in a different time. When he was in the military, he cooperated with us militarily in Sinai. And then he, would, he was nominated to be Minister of Defense and later on the President of Egypt. He had already experience working with us together. When he was in situation after what we call today helps, he got some decision to change the priorities in Egyptian national security. Uh, and that was um, first going and fight very seriously in terrorist organization, according to his definition, and also uh, put very clearly Iran as the most important enemy of Egypt and other uh, countries in the region as well. So that consists in a different definition to the Egyptian uh, national uh, defense uh, idea which meant that he had to cooperate with Israel and also it reflected to the entire region as well. That's really, that, that, that's really uh, uh, a great uh, frame for the, the, the history. And I'd like to come back, uh, Ambassador Koren, uh, later during the questions about your impressions about sort of where, where we're at today. Um, let me move to uh, Professor Rosenbaum. I've already received uh, a, a question from Issa asking what the average person in Egypt thinks about the peace, uh, both then and today. And I think it's maybe a, a, as we were watching those images in the film, you're looking at very sort of different reactions, but you've seen it from, from a, a, a common person in the, in the street, as well as the academics who visit you at the center. So please give us a little bit of perspective on this from what you've seen over the years. Um, as uh, many people know or think they know and uh, tell me and ask me, they, they, they claim is uh, Egyptians hate Israel, Egyptians are against the peace treaty with Israel and uh, that sort of, uh, of things. Uh, because that's what they see uh, in, the, uh, in the media and they read in the newspapers and, uh, and hear. Uh, but uh, what they hear and see is only uh, the opinion of a small part in Egyptian uh, society because uh, the question was about the average Egyptian and I, have, I happen to know the average Egyptian personally, which, uh, which means that I met with uh, during more than 30 years of uh, traveling to Egypt and living, the, living there uh, for several years and visiting there for long visits. I, uh, during that time, I used to speak with uh, up to now several thousand Egyptians. And since I, I speak uh, fluent Egyptian Arabic, I can speak with Egyptians who don't know English, uh, who are the majority of Egyptians. So I don't need an interpreter or translator. And I do not confine myself only to English speaking Egyptians. So I, I managed to speak with the Egyptians who come from the upper, upper class, but also those who come from the lower strata of uh, society and hear what they think. So I can tell, and I can say definitely that uh, most of the Egyptians, they do not hate Israel. They are not against the peace with Israel and uh, they show very positive attitude and very often they are very friendly. They are very curious about Israel. They want to hear and know about Israel. Um, and sometimes they ask me, do all of the Israelis uh, speak Egyptian Arabic? And I tell them, no, uh, most Israelis do not speak Arabic. And very few speak Egyptian Arabic. Um, but since for many I'm the first Israeli they met, they are surprised. And uh, I also have to admit that uh, some of them at the beginning 
show hostile uh, attitude, but after a few minutes of conversation, they uh, changed their attitude and they became uh, very friendly. So uh, hostility is uh, being changed for hospitality. And uh, also I have to say that uh, most of those who are against the peace treaty or against Israel are some groups of intellectuals, journalists, and members in trade unions. The regulations of the union, of the, those unions say that you have uh, to boycott Israel, you don't have to uh, make any contact with Israelis, etc., etc., etc. But I also happened to meet some uh, members of these unions and journalists and intellectuals who in private conversations tell me that they have no problem uh, of meeting with me, talking to me, but they would not uh, do it on public because they don't want to get into trouble. And there are many people uh, like that, which is said. I also uh, had and have some uh, intellectuals and writers and uh, other Egyptians who do it uh, openly. Uh, they don't mind to be criticized, but uh, most do not want to get in trouble, but what you see is not what you get. Uh, so to conclude, I would say that uh, most Egyptians are uh, or very positive or quite positive, positive uh, towards Israel and the peace treaty with Israel. Well, I'm ready to other questions if you want to ask. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I just want to um, focus on one specific area of your expertise. Um, it, uh, uh, your, your, your conclusion is, is one that I think many people commonly are unaware of or have a, a different perception of in terms of um, uh, the, the openness to hospitality from the common uh, Egyptian. But you've worked particularly with academics um, and it have been exposed over the years to people in multiple disciplines. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you could just share a few um, uh, observations uh, uh, in that realm where uh, we do know there's a great deal of hostility in, in a number of academic forums, but working directly with specific academics, what's been your experience and, and does it differ by discipline or do you find uh, other um, uh, uh, opportunities uh, for for collaboration that you've seen in, in uh, through your through your academic center. Um, first, I would like to clarify that I mostly work with the creators of Egyptian culture, like uh, writers and playwrights, and uh, also. Um, some academics, but I, I focus on uh, dealing with the creators or culture, not those who uh, research it. Mm. Um, I, that uh, gave me some fantastic opportunities uh, to do things. I'll give you one or two examples. Uh, some of uh, the lead, leading uh, playwrights in Egypt uh, were uh, very good friends of mine. And uh, sometimes I, they handed me a play which was just uh, written in a manuscript. Two weeks later, I was teaching it at the Hebrew University uh, of Jerusalem. And my students were the first one in the world to read, uh, to read uh, a new Egyptian play that was put on stage two or three years later. And there, there are uh, many examples uh, like that. As for the academic center, uh, it is an institute that was established in Egypt in the wake of the peace agreement between uh, Israel and Egypt. You just saw how it was born. And the idea was uh, to create in Egypt an institute that will uh, promote uh, a cooperation uh, between Israeli scholars and Egyptian scholars and uh, institutes. That was uh, more difficult uh, because also academics, many academics boycotted Israel. And uh, although in private conversations, I heard other things they could not do uh, or act against, uh, against what was imposed on them. Um, 
so what happened uh, with the activity of the academic center, uh, like in the 80s, uh, there was a lot of uh, cooperation uh, in agriculture. Uh, they changed in the 90s and uh, 2000s, and the academic center uh, played an increasing role in helping the promotion of uh, Hebrew studies in Egypt. You will be surprised to hear that there are thousands of Egyptians who study Hebrew in the uh, Egyptian universities, and each year, almost, a new department of Hebrew or Israel studies is opened in another university in Egypt. And I'm talking about all, all over Egypt, from the north uh, to the south. And uh, in the academic center, we have a big uh, library, library of books in Hebrew. And those who want to write PhD and MA thesis, they come to us and we help them with the research, we supply them uh, with materials. And if they want to consult us, uh, they do, and we do it uh, happily. Um, some, are not, some do not feel very uh, confident to come to the Israel Academic Center, so they don't come, but the brave ones are coming. And uh, we had a tradition of bringing uh, leading uh, lecturers from Israel roughly 50% academics from all fields of uh, academic research and 50% the creators of uh, Israeli culture, writers, playwrights, uh, movie makers, and, uh, and others. <coughs> and uh, very often uh, while uh, sitting in a lecture at the academic center, the Israeli lecturer was surprised to meet Egyptians in the audience who are uh, familiar with his uh, writings or creation. And they used to surprise him with, or her with the question that showed that they sometimes know the, the text better than the writer because he might have forgotten what he wrote a few years ago and they could quote by heart and ask. I remember a certain uh, incident when a student corrected the play, a very famous Israeli playwright, and told him, but uh, in your plays, this and that, you say the such and such. And he was completely surprised. Uh, after uh, the lectures, uh, some uh, students created uh, personal relations with uh, uh, their uh, object of research, and that continued through emails and other electron electronic uh, connections. Wow, uh, it, it's fascinating uh, insight about the, the study of Hebrew in Egypt. Ambassador Corin, uh, it, it, it reminds me, and we already had a question about the significance of the Abraham Accords uh, in, in Egypt and other parts of the our, our, our world. And uh, I, I was re uh, saw, saw a news story the other day saying that Hebrew studies have actually opened up in the UAE already. So um, uh, do you think the, that the... Abraham Accords that you can already see and feel the impact of a next step um, having been taken in the Arab world? The question is to me or to Heinz Koren? I'm Hanko. sorry, to Ambassador Koren, yeah. Oh, yes. The uh, things are must be taken in perspective. When Sadat uh, signed the peace treaty with us in 79, in this very year, that was that there was a revolution in the Islamic revolution in fact, and in fact, uh, the what we have called the Arab-Israeli conflict shifted uh, um, gradually to be an Iranian-Islamic-Israeli conflict, and that moved um, slowly uh, but surely the Arabs will be uh, out of the conflict, and only a few deca decades later, uh, it became uh, much uh, uh, better. As, as I stated before, when uh, uh, President uh, Sisi uh, talked with me about uh, cooperation, including military cooperation, you should understand, I belong to the generation 
who fought in the 73rd War. Although I was in Golani Brigade and, and, and fought in the Golan Heights, to me, to talk with the president of Egypt about cooperation uh, after so many years, there was a time that I myself didn't believe that we're talking about peace and cooperation uh, uh, and not only that, uh, with like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Arab Emirates, and some other uh, uh, countries, and in fact, we created a basis of cooperation that uh, uh, consisted on Arab Sunni countries, believe it or not, that used to have an ideology to destroy the state of Israel before, working together against terrorism and against Iran. Now, uh, when um, Egypt was alone at the game of peace with Israel, Egypt could control on the situation. On one thing, he said, Egypt could say to us, look, I would like to go with you to that and that field, but I can't because the Arab fellows, the Arab, they could say, we tried for you to do, to promote things with Israel, but we can't. But now, Egypt is a little bit uh, concerned about the possibility that Israel have a direct relations with the Emirates, with Saudi Arabia, with Sudan maybe, and so on. So is a little bit hesitant about that thing because usually uh, uh, the Egypt was the main power, the main mediator, the main uh, uh, actor in this arena. So, they, of course, they, they was one of the first to congratulate us about the relationship with the Emirates. They are very deep in the relationship that uh, built up with other countries like Sudan, uh, and I know it also from the Sudanese side. Uh, and they see themselves as a cornerstone of a call of a regional coalition that includes that countries, as as long as they can affect on the main promotion of the goal, they support it very heartily. I must say that slowly, and and sometimes not with a very noisy way, President Sisi promotes few things that Gabi can add, maybe from his own point of view, for example putting on the educational system of Egypt uh, the uh, necessity of learning of Camp David Accords by uh, Egyptian students. That's a new thing. Mubarak never done it before. Or the way he talks to his people regarding to Israel, it's very important. We have a long way to go in order to get to normalization. But when other Arab countries uh, uh, joined to the peace with Israel, it's easier to Egypt to be part of uh, a normalizing countries which normalize the relationship with Israel. And uh, that's important because the structure of the Middle East today is so different than it, that they can take initiative and go on with that. And by that, and, uh, you can see, uh, regarding to the question, uh, that uh, uh, the role of Egypt is still the most important, the way we consider it. And we don't think that uh, that is a zero-sum game, that once we consist relationship with the Emirates, we neglecting the relationship with Egypt. That's yeah. not the situation at all. We need, need Egypt there to be part of the story and to uh, move it ahead. It's very important. I think that that's an important uh, uh, point that you made. Uh, and yeah. with apo apologies for the uh, audio, we had some challenges on the bandwidth about the long road. Um, I, I do want to get back to Levy for a moment. We had a, a, a I, question. I, I, May, we I, ask, we may I ask the two experts sure. uh, one question? How come the Muslims from Egypt 
did not arrive to pray in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If our relationship is with the people of, the, of Egypt is so good, uh, I think they they should come to the to pray. It's the third uh, a religious monument, religious uh, in in uh, in the Muslim world. We would I think is I would love to see them coming to coming to to pray over there. How come it's that it's never happened? Uh, Professor Rosenbaum, is that is that a likely uh, 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 next step in the organization or, or further down the road? I lost you. We uh, we are hosting here here a delegation of Egyptians, mostly Muslim. They coming to the holy places. They visit there. Uh, as well as pilgrimages of the Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Ambassador Koren, we have given an audio problem. Yeah. Professor yeah. Rosenbaum, I, I think the question is, uh, uh, given what Pro Ambassador Koren said about the long road toward normalization with Egypt, um, where do you see um, you know, the possibility, and I loved your stories about the students' reactions, uh, both from Egypt coming to Israel. Maybe the answer is that that religion will not be uh, at the forefront of that, but but I, I'm curious from your uh, your analysis of, of the question that, that um, Levy uh, uh, is posing. Uh, um, I, was, uh, I was talking about the uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Go ahead. I was talking about the attitude of the men on the street. Uh, uh, Egyptian tourism to Israel is a matter of uh, internal uh, Egyptian uh, policy. And I think that the Israeli ambassador is the right person uh, to ask about uh, that, uh, that uh, issue. It is true that uh, there are now uh, many, many cops, uh, not now in the corona year, but uh, before that, uh, many uh, cops uh, started coming to Israel to their holy places. I hope, yeah. that, this will, I hope that this will continue with the with the Muslims, uh, but that's that's a decision that uh, Egyptian has to take, and we cannot uh, we cannot interfere in that. I wanted to add something to what uh, Hein said about uh, Ambassador Koren, what he said about the Emirates, that there are now Egyptians uh, who are hoping that the peace uh, agreement be uh, between Israel and the Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, will help them eventually uh, to uh, show more openly their positive attitude toward Israel because, because now Egypt is not alone anymore in the area. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and Levy, one of the points okay, you made, I, I, Levy, I, one of the points you made early on was about the role of the media in uh, the US media in particular and sort of propping up um, and, and showing uh, the possibility of peace and then the leaders sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of stepping into those roles. As you look back on the, on the film, particularly the role, we had a question from Ira about President Carter. Um, given, uh, you know, we've heard reports that there was a fair amount of hostility between Carter and Begin. Um, how, how, did, uh, uh, how did President Carter sort of uh, uh, over the period of time convince uh, the, 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 to overcome those differences and, and to come together in seeking peace? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from my question about the Muslims coming to the Mo uh, to Al-Aqsa Mosque. Sadat was a, a Muslim and very religious Muslim. Begin wasn't a religious Jew, he, did, he didn't keep all some a mitzvot, but he was a very, very Jew in his mind. And Carter was very Christian. They both, uh, they also said 
has a, I would, I would say that they believed that they are doing a, a religious mission almost by going to this peace, peace treatment. And it was all the, all, the, all the three of them. And it's, it's, again, that's why Sadat, when he came to Jerusalem, he, he went to the Al-Aqsa Mosque to pray over there. It was important for him. And uh, Carter was as well that kind of uh, person. And let's admit, Sadat was more um, lovable, let's say. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right expression, but he was a, 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 it was quite easy to love him. Uh, and his Carter was, went very good together. It was very... You can uh, see it and, and, uh, while we uh, they stayed in uh, in Camp David. It was easier with Sadat. He doesn't go to any to details and so on. Begin was kind of a, a kind of a lawyer, and he came to every piece of things. Uh, and there is something else that we should uh, put a, put a, an eye on it. Sadat was the only one over there. Everything was concentrated in Sadat. In the Israeli delegation, there was begging. There was no doubt that he was, he is the one that taking the, the decision. But near, beside him was Moshe Dayan, which uh, the people over there said that he was a pessimistic uh, uh, side of all in the three. And there was as a white man, which is kind of a, a lovable as li like Sadat. Both of them was very friendly and they, uh, so, so Begin was uh, with all the three, uh, they were three and Sadat was alone. And I think Carter would find my, himself uh, easy talking with Sadat and less, and uh, uh, quite problematic with Begin. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but he but, pushed them all the time to each other. As they, I mean, he he took it as a mission, as again, as I said, religious mission. Because I think when I we are speaking about the peace treaty, we shouldn't forget that it's not just a national conflict here in the Middle East; it's a religious one as well. Uh, so we're, we're, we're Muslims, we're, and we should remember it all the time. Uh, absolutely, but I, I, I do want to end on on um, um, uh, 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 just give everyone an opportunity to uh, briefly, uh, uh, in a sentence or two, uh, share where what particular area of of for the future um, may be the most promising to build cooperation and understanding. Uh, between Israel and Egypt. Um, Ambassador Koran, uh, we'll, we'll give one shot to you to see if the audio is working better now. We tried taking you off video. I think uh, we should go on firstly and foremost uh, on uh, common security issues and then moving ahead to civilian cooperation, mostly on irrigation, green energy, uh, agriculture and uh, solar energy and so on, that is extremely important both for us and in Egypt. And due to the fact that we have a new uh, component on the equation now, which is energy, mostly gas, that Egypt, Israel, Cyprus are partners to uh, export the gas uh, to Europe through Greek, I think it's a whole new field of cooperation and understanding and not only but Mediterranean line as well. So it strengthens the relationship between uh, Israel and of course regionally as well. It's very important. So, uh, Professor Rosenbaum, uh, the band's visit made it to Broadway after being uh, a, an Israeli uh, film. Uh, can we expect any breakthroughs in the future in, in, from the, the theater scripts you're looking at? I did not hear all of your questions. 
uh, uh, I, I, I was saying we got we got a piece of Egyptian culture from the, from the Israeli oh. film, the band's visit. Do you, do you, do you oh, think okay. we'll see more of that in the future? Um, I cannot tell because uh, that was an initiation of uh, one person who had the idea to make the movie. It was not something that uh, was done by the government or an institute. It was something private. And it was a very uh, nice movie. Egyptians did not like it very much, I think. Mm. But uh, in Israel, it was quite a success. And I understand that also in the States, also as, uh, as you said, on, uh, on Broadway. Uh, as for uh, cooperation, uh, to continue what uh, the ambassador said, uh, of course, in security, it continues and it will continue which is an, uh, something amazing. Uh, if I remember my childhood, in my childhood, our biggest enemy was Egypt. And now a uh, military cooperation between Israel and Egypt is something regular and for the younger generation, it's not something special. For us, it is really something amazing. And I would, uh, I would restore uh, uh, cooperation in agriculture. And personally, I would like to see a lot of cooperation in the, the academic field. That's great. Um, so we're, we're a little bit over our time. Levy, um, I, I, I know a filmmaker likes to speak less and, and see, have more people actually watch their films. So we're going to actually make that dream come true today um, with, again, the, the uh, uh, generosity of our partners uh, at the uh, um, uh, Office of Cultural Affairs uh, the Consul General of Israel uh, in New York. We will allow everyone afterwards uh, to get everyone that's on um, uh, the call or sends us in a request. We will send for the next week uh, for a time limited uh, period. You'll get to watch the full movie that we just showed some minor clips from. So uh, be looking for that in, in your coming email from the America Israel Friendship League. This was a fascinating opportunity to look at just one small aspect of the Begin legacy and of the impact that it had throughout the entire region leading up till today. So we know we're heading into a holiday season of miracles. We hope that this reflection on this little miracle is something that will brighten your holiday. And we hope you'll be back with us for all of our different offerings, both during the holidays and throughout the rest of the month. This Friends of uh, uh, Friends Indeed series is one that really does seek to build bridges and to look at the legacy of peacemakers and of what the significance of, of Begin's legacy is. It's certainly one of the great contributions uh, 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 that, that, that we can examine and, and offer to you all. So everyone have a, a, a safe week and we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully on Sunday for the next in our series from the America Israel Friendship League.